ready to get serious about building content sites and building a profitable business online? Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. We bring you the latest field-tested tips, tricks, and strategies for building a profitable online asset. We interview industry experts, share customer success stories, and reveal our own experiences working on hundreds of sites to inspire and motivate you to make something happen. Let's do this. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. Today we had guest Michael Donovan. Now, if you've been uh, in the Twitter space for the, with uh, niche websites or listening to other podcasts, you'll probably be, be familiar with Michael. He's currently making $22,000 a month purely from display advertisements and has over 500,000 page views per month on his site. And we cover the background of the site, how he's managed to get it uh, to that state. And we cover one of his methods of brand swapping. We go into detail as well about his niche selection, how he does his keyword research, um, specifically his process when he's looking through Google, whether he's going to target that term or not. And then we cover some things about the future of his site, what he's planning to do um, to continue to grow it and to be able to get some of his time back. So enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Niche Website Builders, an agency dedicated to helping people just like you build profitable content sites. Niche Website Builders are the hands-off content site marketing agency you always wished existed. It's run by content site marketers for content site marketers, and they help both investors and individuals alike build profitable online properties. They provide a fully outsourced approach to content creation, link building, and done-for-you website builds, the same approach they use on their own six-figure portfolios. For example, their content packages come with a proprietary keyword research process, are written by in-house native English speakers, formatted using templates proven to convert, and uploaded to WordPress with affiliate links added so that all you need to do is hit the publish button. Check them out at nichewebsite.builders slash show. That's nichewebsite.builders slash show and fill out the form to get coupon codes for 10% more content or a 10% discount on links with your first order sent right to your inbox. All right, welcome to the Niche Website Builders podcast. Today we have Michael Donovan. Thanks for coming on, Michael. Hey, James. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for coming on. I know you've been doing the podcast rounds recently, so hopefully today we can get you some unique questions and a unique, I guess, take on your website. But first, I would love for you just to maybe give a brief background about, uh, I guess, yourself, how you got onto it and your site. I mean, you're now hitting what, uh, I guess, updated $20,000 a month and around 500,000 page views a month. So maybe just give us a brief background about that site, where you are now, how you got into that. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I'll go just um, not too far back, but like most people, I think my journey started with Pat Flynn uh, in his podcast um, and just learning and hearing from all of the stories of folks who you know started blogging and started a website and were starting to make an income from it. So I know Pat's story uh, was, you know, he was sort of forced and backed into a corner in some ways where, you know, got let go from a job and then just said, hey, I got to make it, right? Uh, and so I had heard a lot of those stories. It, it never motivated me enough to take action at that time. Um, but the more and more you listen to people doing this and doing it successfully, uh, you know, you, you start to get interested in and in how might I pursue that? So I did what a lot of people do, bought a bunch of domains, never did anything with them. <laughs> um, but after, you know, after a, a couple of uh, my first jobs out of college, uh, I just, you know, I wanted to be excited about work. I hadn't had that feeling to some extent of like waking up and not feeling, you know, anxious or like, oh, here comes, you know, nine hours or whatever of the day where I'm not looking forward to it. So I hadn't had that yet. Uh, I had a feeling it was out there. I just didn't know exactly what it might be or how it might be uh, set up. And then, you know, flash forward to two and a half years ago, I was taking the train into my nine to five and uh, listening to more and more podcasts and niche pursuits. Uh, Spencer, who I was on recently, you know, he had owned the yard and he's done this so many different times that it, you know, it, it can be done. The income school guys have done it a bunch of times. I, I talk about John Dykstra a lot. Uh, but you see and hear about it enough and you just like, it, it motivates you to try it. And my job is not bad, uh, but I was <laughs> looking for something else. So I had the commute in, I had the commute back. That was two hours out of my day. This was just before the pandemic hit. 
Uh, and so I just started writing content during that time. Uh, and that's how things started. So this is the first site that I have. Uh, you're right in that, you know, this month I'm on, on pace for, to do 22,000 uh, mm -hmm. and 565,000 uh, page views. So really exciting. The growth has not been fast by any means. It did, you know, have a period where it just went crazy, uh, but it's been a slow burn for the most part. Yeah, it's funny when you start following, I guess these bloggers that are sharing their sites and their revenues, it almost distorts your view of how much you can actually make, you know, doing this. <laughs> Unquestionably. So, I mean, it goes both ways, right? You hear, you know, you don't hear, it's not plastered everywhere, the people who aren't making a lot of money. But if you look in the right places, I find those stories to be, you know, equally interesting, right? Because there's two sides to this, which is, it doesn't always work out. Uh, and I think in my case, it's probably unlike some other people, right? I think a lot of people, it's their second or their third site where they figure it out or they land it. Um, mm. And in this case, it happened to be my first site that I actually started putting content and, and stuck with that it worked out. But you're right, it does distort you. But at the same time, you know, I, it depends what type of person you are. When I mm. see numbers that are just outrageous, my first thought is not negative or pessimistic. My first thought is, I, I got to figure out how they're doing that because yeah. I want to replicate it, right? For sure. Uh, so it's highly motivating to me to see people that are like the John Dykstra's who are saying I'm making 100K a month blogging. You know, my reaction is I'm going to read and watch every single thing that guy's touched that's out there and see if I can figure it out for myself. Um, but yeah, being realistic about to some extent, like this might not work out, right? You might mm. You might go at this for a while and bang your head at the wall and – uh, not make a lot of money from it or it doesn't rank for whatever reason or it's too competitive and we can get into some of those details of you know picking the right niche and things like that but yeah i'm always been motivated by by huge success and excited for those people and then i just want a piece of it right so how do i yeah. how do i get in and do some of it myself what, what's your career day job then because you're still you're still working right yeah, so I'm still working my nine to five so my my career is in i'm a program manager so i i manage a team uh, of, you know, actually spans developers, but it's also just putting product in the market, right? So, you know, working with sales, marketing, uh, support, ops, all of the teams that are involved in the birthing and then the releasing of a product uh, into the market. Uh, so I, I, I like to say that I'm just the guy who makes people talk to each other. <laughs> Most of these people are incredibly bright. Um, they're incredibly capable. And so I get paid basically to help translate and communicate things across teams into different parts mm. of the organization to make sure things are humming um, as they should be. So have you found the time, I guess it might be useful for people who are, who are working and starting their own blogs. Have you found the time to write your own, because you write most of your own content, correct? How have you found yeah, the time? To, to essentially write it with a full-time job? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think, um, yeah, I write about 90% of the content. I have a couple of people who very slowly churn out content for me um, for the remaining 10%. Uh, but the reality is, you know, I make sacrifices in other areas of my life. Uh, I have. Um, and so a big one for me was working out. Like I used to work out pretty religiously. I'd run, I'd lift, and I was very um, consistent on that. That's taken a back seat, you know, and I'll admittedly, that's been something that I've, you know, I've made the time. I think that's the key thing is, you know, I, I forget who said this, but if you, if you're trying to do something and you're, you know, if you just say to yourself and you're not doing it, if you just say to yourself, oh, I'm not making that a priority right now, it kind of flips the switch where it's like, oh, are you working on the blog? No, that's not a priority for me right now. And you instantly start thinking, well, what is a priority? And if that's not a priority, what do I need to do to make it a priority? And it stops the excuses to some extent. And there is time. If you really go through your day, I'd say for most people, other people are in maybe different circumstances, um, but there is time in your day. So gym was a big one. I don't particularly advise that. And I'm trying to balance that back out to get that back into my life. <laughs> but things like, you know, watching Netflix, wasting time on your phone. There's so many you know, minutes in the day that I, I am certain people are wasting. And you, know, you need some of those days where you kind of just veg out. But if you, looked, if you gave yourself a critical look at your week, and I, I mean just more broadly for folks, I am certain you can find hours that you're not using mm. currently. So how many posts are you getting done a week then with your, with your full-time job? Yeah, so, so right now it's be anywhere between 15 and 25. And I'd say probably, mm. I'd say about 15 to 17 of those are me. And then maybe four of those are from uh, the writers. The, you know, the math dep depends on the month. I actually wow, so you're, so you're writing two stuff. a day? No. So no. Uh, 
I'm writing about 17. So that's, you know, about that's 17 a month. Oh, a month. So gotcha. I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. Each month. Um, so that's what, that's the pace I'm at now. And we can talk about, uh, we don't need to get into it at this moment, but this, this idea of brand swapping mm. is a big factor in how much content I'm able to put out there. Well, let's do it. If I didn't let's have that, I don't, I don't think I'd be able to. Yeah. So I, I you know, I've gone over this in depth, but I, at a high level, the idea is, you know, especially in my niche, there are a lot of different brands and manufacturers uh, that are involved. And if you're writing an article, I love using cars as an example, right? If your Ford car won't start, if you write an article about that, about 80 to 90% of the content can be reused for the topic Toyota car <laughs> won't start, right? Because it just so happens that the fixes that are required for those two cars, they're cars fundamentally, right? Now, the brands are slightly different. So the fixes may be slightly different and you need to make sure that you're covering those differences. But I'm able to do that for you know Ford, Hyundai, Jaguar, BMW, all of those different brands for that particular keyword or phrase, which is you know Ford won't start, Hyundai won't start. And I can take, you know, spend time writing one really great piece of content and then doing the research to find the nuances and the differences between the different brands to make sure that they're covered and addressed in the other posts that I put out there. But that's just absolutely crushing it for me. So I can take one mm. post, turn it into how many ever brands there are, and so long as that's a pretty well-searched topic, whatever that topic may be, it's ranking, most of those posts are ranking number one. And if they're not ranking one, they're ranking two. And I have clusters that are bringing in, what my main cluster that I'm doing that with brings in now it's upwards of 90,000 page views of the total uh, for my site. So it's, it's been ranking for almost a year now. Um, I've heard duplicate content, and, you know, it gets thrown around pretty loosely, like, hey, just don't do it. But if you mm -hmm. really look into mm -hmm. it, the guidelines, at least from what I've seen, is that if you get caught using duplicate content, and caught's kind of a, you know, that's not really what it is either. <laughs> but, you know, if it gets it picked up that you're using duplicate content, they just won't index the page. Um, they're not going to demote your site. You don't get some penalty put on your site. So the risk in my eyes, you know, until maybe something changes that I experience, I don't know. But in my eyes, it seems like a pretty low risk. And the reward is clearly very high. I mean, the upside, if you can do it correctly, and I, I, I think I am, uh, I think you can get a lot more bang for your buck in terms of the time you're putting into writing. So that's how a lot of these months, maybe five of the articles are from that strategy that I'm doing. Mm. So I'm able to time crank saver. out. Yeah, it's a time saver and it's super motivating when you sit down to write. You know, If you find one of those keywords that has that brand swapping potential, you're, you're energized to do it because you know when you're done with that first one, you've got 10 more pretty easily right? Um, that you mm. can put out there. So that's how I'm able to keep that pace at the moment. And it's probably not just exclusive to brands either. Cause I'm thinking of, I've come across plenty of examples on, on sites that I have that I, I haven't done that. I've pretty much rewritten the articles. And now I'm thinking like, shit, maybe I should just copy and paste now. <laughs> but I mean, you could even do like, for example, keto for weight loss, keto for building muscle, keto for this, keto for that. I'm sure you're going to have so much similar stuff in there. You could just copy and paste the stuff over and it's not it's such brand swapping. Maybe it's intent or goal swapping. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, I think you're right. I would look at it closer. I for, I'm going to blank on her name, but I had a conversation on Twitter today about this. And the topic was like, can rabbits eat onions? Mm, can rabbits that. eat carrots? And, and actually, when you Google it, like if you just take that and just look at it, see what Google is ranking. And Google is ranking those specific, like Google, can a rabbit eat onions, right? Now, mm. I think the snippet that was one was actually like, a, a post that kind of brought a lot of those together. But I bet you yeah. if you wrote a better snippet, maybe you could steal that. But every single one below that was can rabbits eat onions. So it tells you that Google's, you know, in searchers are looking for that in particular. Now you might say you should write one article. And actually some, sometimes when you look at the documentation and, and some of the people at Google will tell you like, oh, well, what you might want to do is write one post that covers everything that a rabbit should eat mm. or can <clears throat> eat, right? But when you go to the SERPs, that's not what Google's telling you people, you know, it's not, it's not what ranking uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, and so maybe the theory there versus the practice is slightly different. Uh, I just know from my own experience, if I want to know about a particular brand or a particular, you know, something like that, if I see an article that's completely on point, 
right? Mm. Can a rabbit eat an onion? And they go in depth and it's just focused on that. I want that article. I don't want the, here's everything a rabbit can eat. You know what I mean? Like I'm not that, it, I want it geared toward, so, you know, theory versus practice, I don't know. Is it duplicate content? I guess so. I mean, it's 80, I get word for word. Like I'm not even making an effort to put, you know, synonyms in there or rewrite sections slightly. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm just copy paste, find replace on the word, keep what works. And at the end of the day, and I keep going back to this and I've covered this quite a bit, but if you're matching the searcher's intent, why would Google penalize that, right? At the end of the day, if that piece of content in your eyes is the best piece of content serving, covering that topic in a way that's digestible, makes sense, is accurate, I can't see a scenario in which Google says, eh, we'd, we'd prefer this because this is just how we feel about it, right? Like it's, it's serving the reader and that's the whole point. That's Google's whole business model. Uh, and so that's why, you know, and part of me too is obviously biased. I want it to keep working. <laughs> so I hope that it does. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, it's not like some hack or anything. It's, you're still meeting the demand, uh, of someone looks for an answer and you're serving it to them. Right. Uh, that's how I look at it at least. You know, it's funny about that rabbit example. I actually have, my first website was a rabbit website because we had a pet, my wife and I had a pet rabbit back in the day. And I did exactly that. I did a big post about what rabbits could eat and I filled it with everything. It doesn't make for shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I, so it's funny you say that. I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and the best part about SEO is like, you'll, have, you'll bring someone else on and they'll say, I did this monster post and it brings in 100,000. Yeah, it works for all these different keywords and it's ranking. Mm. So it really is like, there's two sides to the coin here, but I did the same thing that you just described and yeah. I did it for a specific topic. And this was early on. And I spent, you know, I spent multiple days like yep. crafting this yep. one post. Yep. It's still on my it's site. It gets nothing. And it's yeah. good. Like the content's good. Uh, it just gets nothing. And if I had just wrote, you know, individual posts for that, I probably could have got, you know, maybe the one or two spot and sizable traffic. So you just got to, you know, my, my limited experience with this, Go with what's working. I mean, you can listen to what people are saying as long as you're not doing anything that's outright scammy or trying to game the system. Like, again, I'm doing it. it it's one, it's just smart in the sense of like, if you can make it, reuse it. But two, always get back to what is Google's business model? Giving the reader what they're looking for. If you are doing that with your article and your search, go for it. Well, by all means, I would just, I would deliver that content however you can. And if it's copying and pasting word for word, because it makes sense, I do it. It's working for now. I've heard a lot of people have given feedback in the comments. Like it's almost like people are afraid to even acknowledge it or talk about it, but uh, <laughs> they're like, Hey, I'm doing this. I copy and paste whole sections. Uh, it's working for yeah. me. So I've seen, I've, I've seen that. And, and I guess, cause I'm, I'm mainly within, the, I guess the fitness niche as well. People like within, for example, Olympic weightlifting, one of the big websites is catalyst athletics. So one of the big I guess, weightlifting brands in America. And a lot of the content's the same from article to article because it's going to be similar with things. Even if you're looking at um, building muscle with um, RP periodization, they do the same thing. It's like copy and pasted guidelines for each thing, for building muscle, for back, chest, whatever. The guidelines are the same, but maybe just exercise is different. So yeah, it seems to work. Yeah, exactly. And in that case, you know, if I came to them looking for how to build muscle, back muscle, if those guidelines happen to be the same for how to build a chest, right? I don't care mm. personally from the reader's yeah. perspective. I found what I wanted. <clears throat> and then from the publisher's perspective, they got to reuse some content and some good, you know, good research, hopefully, that they've done for multiple topics. It's kind of a win win, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, you know, no one's losing in that scenario, basically. Yeah, for sure. Going back to your website, how many posts do you currently have on there? And are you able to share maybe things like RPMs and how it's monetized? Yeah, happy to. So there's uh, 252 posts, I think, as of today on the site. Um, it's monetized primarily through display ads. Uh, and so I'd say, actually, it's almost entirely display ads. So I'd say probably like 95% at this point. I think mm -hmm. I may, I'm making less and less from affiliates. And primarily that's because I haven't put in a new affiliate link in any of my content in a while. <laughs> uh, my focus has just been going after these low competition, high volume pages that I can win and display ads pay, you know, pay fantastic. And for me, it's like for my, my time, 
I bet you if someone knew how to do affiliates, which a lot of people do, if they looked at my site, they'd be like, hey, you should do this, this, and this, and there'd be some quick wins there. But for me, I'm like, I'm just going to keep pouring content on. I can always go back, right? I can always optimize mm. later. Once you get the eyeballs, then you do what you want. You don't want to go too crazy, but you could add some affiliates and stuff there. So I'm, I'm somewhat justifying that uh, for myself. RPMs are in between 30 and 40. They're typically oh, around nice. the higher end of, of closer to 40. Um, in November, so I moved to Ad Thrive in mid-December of last year. Mm. Uh, so I got the end of December, which was good, but then November rolled around and my RPMs jumped to 73 during that period where it was just like, I didn't know if it was going to stop. You know, you're, you're, I was new to it. I, I didn't know what to expect. I actually didn't even know really much <laughs> too much about seasonality, although I did hear November, December were good, which was part of my motivation to get on there quickly. Yeah. Um, but I saw that and I was like, oh man, like I'm, I'm retiring. <laughs> and then, you know, then of course January comes around and everything just plummeted. I mean, I went from RPMs as high as almost 80 to down to like 20 uh, within mm. two days. So it's like a very, and I have that graph on, I shared that on Twitter. Um, yeah, it was, uh, but anyways, the trend is what you really should care about if you're doing this full time or, or part time even. Look at what you're doing, you know, annualized, right? Average, what are you making? That's what really the focus should be. Month to month is going to change actually quite a bit. It's, you know, average it out and that's really what your focus should be. So we can expect you to double your revenue almost in Q4. I, you know, I am really excited for Q4. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, this Q1 historically is the worst month for ads, display ads, just given, you know, marketing spend budget. They blew through most of it, you know, in Q4, rightfully so during the holidays, Black Friday, Christmas, that's where their spend is. Q1 rolls around, people aren't spending as much, so the, you know, they're not buying ads, rightfully so. But as the year goes on, historically, if you look at the trends year over year, you know, it's up and to the right for ad spend. And so I think just as long as nothing happens to the site, I keep putting quality content, I keep maintaining or growing, you know, November, December this year could be very uh, interesting. So I'll be excited about seeing those two months. In theory, I should see a forty thousand dollar month, with this, which is crazy mm. even to think about. Um, and I, you know, I'm counting my chickens before they hatch here, so I don't want to do that either. <laughs> but it, it'll be interesting to see, uh, and I'll document the journey, so it'll be you know, it'll be out there, good or bad. But uh, awesome. I'm excited for for those months coming up. What I want to know is how did you decide on this niche? Uh, from what I've heard, is it something to do with your career job? Like you're considered maybe an expert in that area, or is this something maybe a yeah, side so niche it, of that? I'm, f I'm happy to share uh, the high level that it's in the tech space. Mm -hmm. I know that's very broad. Everything's technology these days. <laughs> um, and so it doesn't directly align uh, with my job, but it's definitely something I'm interested in. And to, to some extent, I got lucky with just how many keywords there are. Like when I chose this niche, I'd love to say that I did a bunch of research. I dug in deep. You know, I checked all the boxes and then I bought the domain and then I started. But actually, I was interested in the topic. I knew I could write about it for a long time and I just jumped in. And in jumping in, I did all my competitive analysis. And, you know, I talked about this before, but my list of competitors was over 100 sites long by the time I was done. It still is. I still add to it, you know, every week when I find a new site that pops up that's ranking for some low, low competition keywords. So there's just a plethora of content that I could write. I could write by myself if I didn't if I don't scale this, I could write for another two years, I'm pretty confident, and continue to grow the site. Mm. So I think I, I you know there's absolutely an element of luck there that I kind of put myself in a space. Now, did I think about the space? Did I think about is this broad enough that I could write about for a long time? I did, but I didn't do the hard work, which I will do on my next site. When I when I jump in on my next site, I will do everything I did the month after I bought my domain in this case, <laughs> I'll do that beforehand, right? With a couple of spaces, a couple of niches, a couple of topics, I'll do keyword research, I'll build lists, you know, I'll put that time in because if you don't put that time in and you don't get lucky in some cases, like the luck was that it worked, there's still a hot, lot of hard work that went into making it work. But if you pick a thing or a space or a topic that's too narrow, you could get into it and even if you wrote for three months and realized it was too small, that's extremely demoralizing. Uh, it's a ton of hard work. Three months, you're not getting that time back. Maybe it was a good learning experience. I would say keep going, but that's easy for me to say. 
if I sat my butt in a chair, waking up early, staying up late, sacrificing things I like to do to build this thing, and then I realized three months in that, oh, my niche is way too small. There's not enough keywords. I'm, I'm basically, I've written for three months and I, I'm struggling to find content. That would be a tough realization. So I would do that work up front now, but I definitely got lucky early on. Do you have an example of what you would consider maybe a niche that's too small? Yeah, so I, this example is probably exhausted at this point, but <laughs> um, someone suggested, and I can't get out of my head around tennis rackets, right? So you could say in, in the progression of tennis as a niche, you could say racket sports, you could say tennis, you could say, um, you know, tennis played on grass, then you could say like left-handed tennis players, right? Like <laughs> you do not want to be at that, those bottom two rungs, right? You want to be up at that, probably that tennis level or that racket sports level. Because what I found is I, my, I mean, my Twitter handles niche down. So I believe in niching down, but I don't believe actually in niching too far down in your domain. Your domain does not need to be like these, the, the history of, of building sites used to be exact domains, right? That was an easy way to sort of hack the, the algorithm. If you wanted to write about, you know, left-handed tennis players, you just make your domain left-handed te tennis players.com and that helps you rank. Now you want to write about tennis, maybe keep the domain at the tennis level and then start your content in your, your, the topical authority that you're going to build, you niche down there, Right. So you talk about tennis, but then you have 10 articles about how to serve. And that's you niching down. You're niching down your topic, right? And you're trying to build topical authority in Google's eyes that, hey, this guy knows everything about serving. So once some of those articles start to rank, you're the guy about tennis serves. And oh, by the way, they kind of learn, hey, you talk about tennis. And then you have another topic that's about the best tennis rackets or about whatever it may be. But you're niching down in different topics within your higher level niche. And that's how you get authority. If you just sprayed and prayed, you know, you start a website about tennis rackets and then you wrote about 50 articles on 50 different topics within tennis, you mm. might not rank for any of them. Maybe you rank for a couple um, and then you lean in there and that could work. But, you know, my suggestion is to niche down about five different topics early on and, you know, do five or 10 different posts on just that little topic within your space hit publish and see which ones of those work, right? And then lean in even further. Um, but definitely don't back yourself in a corner with your domain or your niche early on because, uh, and, and you should do some keyword research. Learn how to do it before you start. That can be challenging maybe for some people because a lot of it is feedback. Like you're like, oh, this is working, this isn't. But if you do the keyword research up front and spend that time, you should be able to find a lot of keywords um, as you get better at it. And if, you, if you're really struggling to find 30 keywords, you know, what are you going to do when you start writing? You got to write <laughs> about something. You need those keywords, right? Uh, so I would do the work up front or as much as I could before starting. Before I get you to dive into that keyword area, are you doing similar writing with your own site in terms of writing for maybe one specific topic until you fill it and then moving on? Or have you kind of spanned across most of them at once? So I... Early on, I didn't know what I was doing, so I was just writing. And then lately, what I've started to do is I pull RPM reports from AdThrive, mm. and it'll tell you per page what your RPMs are. And then I'm going in, and there's probably a better way to do this. I'm sure someone's listening to this going crazy, but <laughs> I take that spreadsheet, and then I manually sort. So I'll build the clusters, right? So if, I'm, if one of the topics that I write about a lot is Ford, right, like Ford whatever, I'll take all of those articles, I'll organize them together, and then I'll do the average RPM mm. across that entire topic. And I do that for every single little niche down topic on my site. And then I look at it and I very quickly can say, I wrote five articles on this topic, it's paying 19 RPM, $19 for the RPM. I got this other topic over here that pays 65. I'm leaning in heavily on that one because I can mm. get a fraction of the traffic and I'm gonna make more money on those posts than I would if I got more traffic with this lower RPM post. So that's how I'm thinking about it now. So I can rank, I'm ranking for a lot of topics now. So it's less about, am I gonna rank for the topic and more about leveraging my, making sure the time is getting the highest earnings, the highest mm. results. So I'd rather write about something that gets low volume, but very high RPMs because the earnings in the end will be higher in most cases. How often are you uh, taking these reports and analyzing that? 
So I do it like once a quarter. It's not worth, okay. I don't think it's worth doing it uh, more often than that. And even once a quarter, you probably could get away with it doing it twice a year, to be honest. Um, but if just, the, it's very eye opening because there's some topics on my website that if I, you know, if I could tell you offline what they are and you would mm. say, oh, they pay fantastic. And I would tell you they pay terribly. They're the worst paying top. It, it's <laughs> shocking to me. I don't understand it. And I have like 12 articles on this topic. And consistently, they pay in the low 20s for RPMs, which, mm. again, I'm talking about my niche. That's for my space. RPMs are different depending on what you're in. In the space that I'm in, it's the lowest paying topic on my site, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but I'm done writing about that for now because yeah. well, it's not worth my time. I could get a page that gets 15,000 page views a month, but all I need is 4,000 page views on this other topic to make the same amount of money, right? So it's worth leaning in heavily on this other side. Uh, but I think you get away with doing it probably once a quarter or, or twice a year even. Nice. All right, I, want, I would love for you to dive into your keyword research method because I know you posted on Twitter, I think yesterday even, it was very recently, how you decide yeah. whether you're going to be able to rank number one for a term. So do you want to maybe jump through and, and dive into your process there? Yeah, happy to. So it's, it's funny as um, I, so I heard or saw someone tweet this recently where they're like, the things that you start to take for granted you, if you if you have a little bit of a beginner's mindset, you remember very quickly that you knew none of this, you know, six months ago or a year ago, and you just take it for granted now because it's part of your everyday routine. And when mm -hmm. I shared that, I was like, I I find it interesting. I thought it was going to be useful, but I don't realize how useful it is to people to just go through your thought process of, all right, I found a keyword. Is this thing going to rank? Is it worth my time? Um, so I'll just I'll just run through basically that thread to the best of my how I remember it, but. Mm -hmm. You take a keyword, right, and you use a keyword research tool. It could be SEMrush, could be Ahrefs, or however you say it. It doesn't matter. Uber suggest all of these are fine, right? They're imperfect. They're tools. They're just giving you data points, and you, you're looking for keywords that show some volume. Now, there's a lot of we. Don't, I don't need to go down the rabbit hole of like. There's a lot of keywords that show no volume that do great. I'm not saying don't go after those, but for me, these signals, in my experience, if it shows any volume, it's typically far underestimating it. So that's usually a good sign. It's usually like four or five X the volume that some of these tools show in my experience. Mm. So I look for something that shows some volume. Say your benchmark is 500, right? You're looking for a volume of 500. Great. You have your keyword. It shows a low difficulty score that a lot of these tools will give you a difficulty score on some of these things. That's imperfect as well. You want something that you can compete for. So I, I think under 50 on, on a lot of these tools is probably a good, I think some of them use different metrics, but looking for something in the you know moderate to easy not hard uh for difficulty mm. start there and then i take that keyword and i plug it into a couple different areas so one is uh, google's keyword planner that is a free tool if you fake set up an ad account with them you can put in keywords that you might bid for or potentially bid for and it will spit out just a range of what the volume that that keyword gets so it'll be one it's on you know an exponential scale, I think, but it's at one to 10, it'll tell you, or 10 to a hundred searches a month or a thousand to 10,000. Again, it's imperfect, but it gives you another data point to say, in fact, this keyword is getting searched every month. Now I have two data points suggesting that that's the case. And then the third thing I always do is start typing it into Google and see if uh, auto -com Google autocomplete completes that for me. And if it's in that dropdown, you know, I'm certain that, that that phrase is getting searched. Minimally, it's getting searched each month. How often? You never know until you rank for it, right? Um, so that's like step one is, is this thing getting volume? And then step two is, how competitive is it, right? It's not enough just for it to get some volume or be searched. You want to make sure if you're going to spend your time writing on this topic that you will rank for it because you don't have a lot of time. And if you're going to write, you're going to write for something that you can get volume and that you'll rank for so I go immediately to page one, right? And just look at it. Like, just take a minute, scroll down the page, look at the top, look at the middle, like just see what's ranking. Um, if you're writing a blog post, you want to make sure Google is interested in ranking blogs. Uh, that sounds obvious, but <laughs> you'd be surprised how many people will write about something and not really have looked at page one and been like, actually, Google's more interested in ranking product pages or e-commerce pages for this particular topic. Maybe they, Google has its own products up there at first. They're, they're getting their share. Below that is maybe a bunch of videos. Below that's maybe a bunch of actual product pages. And then there's one or two blogs in there. It's not the best sign for you, right? You're trying to rank number one. That's the goal always, or one, two, or three, minimally. If, you, if no blogs are up at the top, you're probably not the right format for that particular keyword. So I might rethink it right off the bat there. 
And then I dig in deep, deeper, right? So then the next level would be, you know, just scan the page for forums. That That is the most obvious thing. I think everyone that does SEO to any extent should know that. Google doesn't love ranking forums. If you see Quora, if you see these random other forums, if you see Reddit, immediately to me, I, I'm like, if I see that on page one, I think I can get on page one, minimally. So right off the bat, it's just a quick telltale that that keyword phrase is a little weak. There's some, there's not a ton of content there. It's a little bit thin. Otherwise, likely a forum wouldn't rank. That's most of the time. There are some cases where actually forums are really interesting uh, to get people's perspective and maybe Google wants to rank them. But if you see three, four forums on there, I mean, you're, you're right in the article probably. And then going into the individual articles. And I'm not going actually in there necessarily to get the topic or doing research at this point. I'm just looking to see how, what is the content quality. Are they matching the exact keyword phrase in the title? Are they matching it um, in the you know in the URL? Are they targeting that topic specifically, or is it kind of like a back end way that they're covering it? Actually, the topic something else, and this is a subtopic. Or are they really covering this thing in depth? And then, how many words are they using? Are they using photos? Is it useful when you read it? Like. Are they actually giving value with that or do you think you could do better? Um, and then I do that for each of those posts. So I'm just looking through each of them, just like how good is it? How spot on is it? Are they matching it? Uh, and then I do a little bit of checking of domain authority. You can use Ahrefs tool of just like take the URL, dump it in there. Anything like 30 and under, actually really 40 and under uh, is like something that you probably might be able to compete with in terms of website strength. Uh, and that's more or less it in a nutshell. But I think the point in saying that was one, just how I think about it. It takes a while to say it, but I'm doing it now very quickly. Like I can scan a page and within, you know, a minute or so, I have an idea of whether or not I should just click off that page. And then within another minute, I'm like, I'm writing it or not. Uh, and you just get really used to looking at it. And that's why early on I said in a, one of my tweets, I'm like, there is intuition. Like if you do this long enough, there's this thing that you can't quite put like a mathematical equation around where mm. you just have this instinct where you just either know or you don't, right? You're like, I can rank or I can't. Uh, and you have all these different data points, but it's the combination of those data points and how you understand them, which determines the yes or no, right? Yeah. So you get it's very just good time on the this. SERP, right? Totally. And the more you do anything, right, you just get, it becomes like a muscle. You just like, and I'll just be clicking in and out of pages, right? So it's not like this. Mm. In the beginning, it's laborious and it takes time, but you kind of have to go through that to know what you're looking for and then use the results that you're getting, right, to confirm or deny. Like if you're not, if you did this process and you're like, oh, I'm going to rank and six months later, none of your stuff's ranking, you got to revisit what you're looking at because you're probably, mm -hmm. you're probably doing something wrong, right? Or the content's bad. That's possible. Yeah. Too, but yeah. So then how are you then constructing your article? So you found um, a term, there's maybe a few... I guess blogs ranking in the, in the top five positions, whatever it is. Do you then go into those blogs and then maybe look to match the headings and the topics they're covering with what you're covering? Or are you looking at maybe creating something completely unique? Yeah, so I am a huge advocate of doing YouTube research. I think this is becoming more and more common um, of people that are going to YouTube. If you're not using YouTube to do your research, you're just, in my opinion, you're just missing out massively because it doesn't matter how obscure or odd the topic is or the keyword phrase. I guarantee you there's seven people filming themselves talking about it <laughs> and they're talking about what works and what doesn't and they're showing you, right? They're proving it to you. So I start there. I'll build my article going through YouTube and I look at things like view count, I look at things like I, I hate that they got rid of the thumbs down. That really that like, hurts mm. me because um, it was a good tell, right? Like people will let you know if they wasted their time watching your video on how to do something and your video didn't solve their problem, they're going to, they'll let you know, they'll give you the thumbs down. That was useful to me because I'd be like, all right, maybe this isn't the best place to get my information from, but thumbs up is useful. And then comments, people always will let you know in the comments and they'll say, Hey, you know, what you just did, that was great, or this is correct, or this is wrong. And so you can start to piece together this article based on the knowledge that you're building on the topic by going through YouTube. So I start there. I also don't want to cloud myself because if you read these top six or seven posts, you're going to be very like, you know, biased towards what you think you should be covering. So I start with YouTube. Then when I'm done putting together sort of the outline from YouTube, 
that's when I'll go back to page one because they're ranking for some reason, right? Google thinks that what they are doing is working. It, it's correct in some way. And I'm looking for like glaring holes in what I wrote, right? If there's a topic or something that I'm just not covering and like everyone is, I'll look closer at that. And if I need to add it, I'll add it based on that alone. Um, but you know, you probably see this a lot. The page one is just like, you know, incestuous in a lot of ways. It's just like these, <laughs> these people are just regurgitating each other. Yeah. Um, and if you want to do that, <clears throat> fine, you can get on page one, but I want the top spot. And I think to do that, you just have to be better, right? It's not that you have to be different. If they're all correct, then you're just going to end up writing an article that's the same anyway. Uh, but a lot of times they're not, and they just all kind of cherry picked from each other. And so it's just one big, you know, piece of content basically across four or five articles there. So start with YouTube and then fill in the gaps with what's working there. And don't go too far off base. I'm not saying like be a pioneer because you might just not rank at all if you're not <laughs> following what they're doing. But I, I just don't like the idea of, you know, going to another post and just taking what they're doing already and changing it slightly for my own preference. Yeah. Do you use people also ask as well? Is that form, form part of your article headings? I don't. So I'm familiar with the tool. Um, I look at the... I just scroll down. I don't actually know if this is the same result. Maybe it's similar. Excuse me. But when I scroll down to the bottom of page one, it, or is that what you're talking about? Is there an actual tool? Yeah, so, or, or, like, no, so, so obviously down the bottom is the related searches. And then within the actual search, I've got the people also ask questions with the drop. Oh, at the very top where it'll... Mm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll scan that. I, look, I actually look at the related um, a bit mm. more. So I'll look at people also ask because obviously that's going into detail, pretty pretty granular detail on that particular topic. Um, but actually some of the related ones, sometimes they should be standalone posts, but a lot of times they're just like extrapolations of the thing that you should yeah. write about. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Now, again, some of them should be actual dedicated posts, but yeah, I think a combination of both is probably great. I actually don't spend a lot of time looking at the top part, mm. um, the people also ask part. Um, I probably should look at that a, a little bit more, to be honest with you. But uh, I look at the, re the related at the bottom, and that th some of those become my headings, like straight up as they are, become headings in my posts. Nice. Do you have a internal linking strategy on your site, or is it just wherever is relevant, you're just linking to whatever? So there's not a strategy per se, but because I've written almost every single article myself, that's actually one of the benefits of when you write all the content. Mm. You know, when you I outsource agree, yeah. stuff, you probably just forget what you wrote or what's out there. But I, I know this stuff pretty intimately. So when I write a post, it's not a lot of work for me to be like, as I'm writing, to be like, oh, I should link that to the article that I wrote, you know, five months. Like I, it's not so many articles that I can't remember what I wrote about. Um, and again, because I wrote them. So I, I will just, where it makes sense, I will link them. And to be honest, like I don't have some master interlinking plan or strategy. It just, if it's relevant, if I think it could be useful and add some value to the reader, like, hey, if they actually clicked and read this thing, it would help them, I'll link to it. Um, and I do that always. So there's always a link to another article, unless I have no content, that's, which is very rare at this point. Mm. Um, but yeah, I always will link. Uh, I won't you know, overdo it and only if it's useful to the reader. Gotcha. And what about off page? Have you done any, any link building to your site now or is this just purely content? I've done uh, zero link building and I haven't done any guest posting. I, I, you know, I struggled early on. One of the reasons I didn't want to get into blogging was because of all this link building stuff. Like I had, <laughs> I had read some stuff. I had seen some podcasts and I was like, that sounds exhausting. Like you're just like spraying and praying, you know, you could send a hundred emails you get three back and it's just a lot of time. And the income school guys, their approach is really what turned me on to this was Forget all that. It's not to say it doesn't work. It to, you know, inter, having links to your site, backlinks to your site, obviously is an incredibly strong signal, like from Google, right? It can gives you the authority. It, it tells Google that you're legit, especially if they're relevant links, right, within your space. There's no question it works. But their approach was spend that time writing quality content, and over time you will get organically you're going to get links because if you rank. You're going to be t towards the top and you're just going to attract links to your quality content throughout time. Maybe it's a slower burn and a slower process to find some success with the approach of not building links. I don't know. Um, but that's worked for me. And especially writing, which this is now becoming more and more common. I think people should look into this further is look closely at keywords that might not get a lot of volume, 
but that are very research and data oriented. And if you can get something where you have to do the work yourself to like original research on a particular mm. topic, even if it gets 20 hits a month, you're going to just find amazing backlinks come back to you for that content because someone is going to start writing a piece of content or, or, you know, some sort of research themselves and they're going to need supporting evidence or supporting something. And they're just going to grab you because you'll be number one. It, you'll give, you'll show your work. You'll be credible. And I have like two or three posts on my site that don't get a ton of traffic. Um, but that get most of my backlinks uh, to my mm. site because of that. And I, I heard that first, I heard it on, niche pursuits at one point. And I know John Dykstra is a huge advocate of that. He might, it might've been his interview. Um, but you know, he does that a lot where he just writes, you know, these little research posts that just are link magnets for his sites. And then that, you don't have to do any outreach. I, I hate, yeah. you know, cold emails and cold, you know, Hey, can I, <laughs> could I please write a post on your site? It's just, none of it was appealing to me. It still isn't frankly. Um, and so the idea that you could spend that time writing content instead is, is, was intriguing enough for me to just ignore backlinks. Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that. I don't think I've shared it on this on this podcast yet, but one of my a lot of my topics I write are almost like journal literature reviews from from the research. That's kind of my part of my background, and I have this post essentially bagging a supplement company, and it ranked number one for a bunch of terms, and it ended up getting picked up. Someone linked to it from a published research journal article. So like one of the top, whatever it is, I don't know how they got away with that because you can't cite blogs as sources, but they managed to link, got a link from that. And it's so damn, I ended up 301ing that page to another side of mine, but that link is so damn powerful. My original site, the homepage ranks on the second page of Google for that term, even though I have no content on there, nothing about that thing. But that link just comes back from that site. See, so that's, that's funny. incredible. That tells you two <laughs> things. One that not building links and doing this strategy is a way to build links and two, mm. the power of links, right? I mean, it's yeah. undeniable that they work, um, but getting them and how you go about getting them, there's many different ways, like all things in SEO, which I love, but I love that. Like you're on page two, you've got nothing on there. It's just the authority of this other site. The signal is so strong to Google. They're like, we should put him up there, right? We should yeah. surface him somehow. Um, so yeah, it definitely has, it works. And I think in the interview I did with Jared on niche pursuits, he, he said it right. He's like, everyone's a little bit lazy to some extent. Right. So like that person, it's not to say that yours wasn't amazing content, but mm. they just probably rank number one. It kind of supports my argument. Let me just steal that link and put that, <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. put that in there. Right. <laughs> uh, and if anyone's looking to, to get hands off links, or you can also go through niche website builders, you can buy link packages there too. So that, that's an easy way of going about it without having to do all your own cold outreach. But yeah. what I wanted to- Yeah, let to someone move... else suffer for you, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but what I also want to touch on is maybe the future of your site. Obviously, right now you're making 22K a month. You're obviously continuing to write posts and things like that. What is the future plan? Big flip, keep growing, build new websites, quit your day job? Yeah, so I, I'm not going to quit uh, my day job and primarily because I, I want multiple streams of income before I do that. There's, there's still, you know, there's risk in everything. Um, I, I also want, there's a few things we want to do in terms of getting another mortgage and banks don't take kindly to people that don't have a lot yeah. of you know, history. So so there's healthcare, uh, another baby, like there's certain reasons to keep your nine to five. Uh, and so for now, I think just, I like my job. That's not going to go anywhere. But in terms of plans, for the site. So actually within the last week or two, I've gone pretty deep. I don't want to share the company yet uh, until I actually have maybe something positive to say, or maybe I won't say anything at all. But um, <laughs> the, the idea of having somebody take over doing the content on my site is something that I've been interested in the last six months more and more. Like I'm not burnt out by any means, but I am definitely getting tired of writing the content and doing what the, you know, the path that got the, what got me here, I don't think is going to get me to the, a million because I just don't know if I'll be able to sustain what I've been doing for that long. Uh, and so I've explored a company that basically will take over the site and uh, more or less, and they will do, you know, 10 to 20 articles a month on my behalf. Now, there's a lot that has to go right for me to actually do, you know, I think I'm going to try it for a month. Uh, is what we're talking about. and But there's a lot that has to go right. In my experience, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. And content quality, no one's going to 
to, to care as much as yeah. you're going to care. Um, so that's been my biggest hurdle. But in talking with these, you know, this, this group of people, I think they have the right in-house people to do it. Uh, it's expensive and in a weird way, I'm like, well, it should be probably right. Like if you're going to get, if you're going to get someone who's going to actually do this thing and grow it right, uh, you know, it probably should cost, uh, a certain amount. And so it'll be interesting. I will absolutely document the journey, uh, about how that goes. But in my mind, if I can get my site even to hum along as it is, which would be a sin in a lot of ways, cause I think there's a ton of growth left for the site. Uh, but if I can get it to stay, to stay stable and potentially to grow and I can give a, a tiny piece of my monthly income to do that, or not tiny, but you know, small enough that it's not impacting me an, a lot, and then I get all of my time back and I can mm. focus on things like, which we can talk about a little bit, but nichetwins.com, it's you know, my, my identical twin brother starting to do this and we're just trying to like, you know, share income reports, share our progress, share what's working. But that's one side project that I'm interested in. My, my wife has started a site that, you know, we got an age domain kind of by chance. She's already got three articles up there. All of them are on page two. I'm already like chomping at the bit to get in there because <laughs> I know like Google just is hungry for more content on that site. So there's other things that I'm interested in. And I think if I did the math out in terms of what my time's worth, I think this is probably the right move if the content quality is there. I'm not going to just dump bad content on the site. So that's my you know, long-winded answer to the plan. I'm a little bit nervous about it, um, to be to be frank, but we'll see mm. how that goes. I'm only you know signing a contract. Though? You know what's going to happen when you free up all this time? You're just going to fill that time back up with all the other sites. And I'm totally okay <laughs> with that. Because, and, and I'll tell you why. I know that will, that will happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, my goal is not to free up my time so I can go sit on a beach somewhere. I want to do this again. And I think the mm. ROI on my time you could argue like, hey, you already have a site that's working. You should just lean in more and spend all of your time on the site. And your chances of making, you know, another 20000 a month are probably higher. You, you know, I think that's actually a fair argument of just leaning in heavily to the site, the site that's working already. But, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a robot. Um, and I, I have like other things that I'm interested in and that I want to do. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like the money piece is why I got into this, but there's other motivating factors as well. Like I want to be interested and excited again, uh, in writing and, and doing a site. So, so that's where I'm at. So if I can get that, if that goes well for me and they can grow it and I can continue to add content and build that out, just like the idea of my week being given back to me after my nine to five to explore building out niche twins or building out you know, mm. some of these other sites, uh, is exciting. Uh, and it will give me more to talk about, you know, you can only talk about one site so long before you kind of <laughs> get sick of, you get sick of building it, talking about it, uh, everything. So, um, so anyways, that's what the, the future holds and I'll let people know how that goes. Do you want to dive in a bit into your side project then? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, there's not a whole lot there and we don't have some master plan at the moment. It's just, you know, I have a, an identical twin. Uh, he's also on Twitter. Uh, so he's patient at patient publish and he's sharing a lot of stuff. You know, we both we're using the same process. It's almost, you know, it's identical in a lot of ways of what we're doing and it's working. So he's up to, I think the latest was 40,000 page views, uh, mm. 40,000 sessions. He needs 50,000 to get into media vine. Uh, he's on an age domain. I think it's month six or seven for him. So that would be a pretty good result. Mm. I mean, if he can get on Mediavine in six or seven months, um, you know, he's been a machine pumping out all the content, 100% of the content himself. I think he's up nice. to 120 articles now uh, cool. in that period of time. That's quick. He's got it. It's very quick. Uh, he's using brand swapping on that site as well. That's helped him scale, no question about it. And it's working for him. Um, but he's got a kid coming in October, his first kid. Uh, I have an 11 month old, so mm. I think he's starting to feel a little time crunch of like, I got to get what I can get done now. Yeah. And uh, once the kid comes, I'll have this thing set in motion. But anyways, the two of us have always wanted to work on something together. Uh, and so niche twins, we're both building these sites. We're both talking about it. We're active on Twitter and Twitter's great, but you can only say so much, right? So I have, we've only put up our <laughs> last month's progress reports and sort of the, how that's gone. And we're going to do that every single month for each of our sites. But I want to get into more like this brand swapping topic, I, there's more I can do with visuals and talking through more specifics than I could do on Twitter, right? So only so many characters and that format's a little bit different. So we want to share uh, more educational stuff on that site. And I think, you know, hopefully freeing up some of my time will allow me to do that. Um, but yeah, mm. that's, that's nichetwins.com. There's, um, 
there's uh, there's some stuff there, and then you know we'll see where that goes. But it'll it'll be interesting in the next couple of years looking back. Like, hey, I you know, just like my site, I started slow, um, got into it more and more, and then just chip away every day. You know, that's what Keith and I were talking about. It's like we didn't have a site, we talked about it, we made a to do list, we banged out the to do list. Now we have a site up, and we have you know a couple pieces of content, and we just keep doing that day after day, you know, month after month. We'll have maybe a business at some point on there. Mm. Um, so, anyways, that's the that's the side project, but uh, it, it's been fun so far. You plan on then creating another niche site as well, like this this current one you have. So, if I write for another site, I just can't avoid my the the site that my wife started. It, the content, the, the possibilities are so wide, and I've looked, I've done some competitor research uh, for her. In three of the sites that are crushing, the, you know, no offense to their to the content there, but it's thin. It's not very good. The photos are really bad. It's in the travel space, high level. Photos mm. go a long way in, in in the travel space. If you're using stock images, you know, I, there's just I know they can be beaten, and those sites are killing it. So if they're killing it, <laughs> I know she can kill it. Um, and she writes great content too. So I would be I'd be very tempted to just like double up with her and just start dumping content on there. Uh, she's only has three posts on there. If we get that to 50 and just see where that goes, I think mm. that site could do very well. Um, so I probably would go to that. And that would be a display ad play or that would be affiliate play? So, you know, I don't what, – what's interesting to me about it is that it would definitely be display ads. But I think that space is a bit different. Although I'm seeing like uh, a few folks on Twitter, they're in the travel space. They're making like $69 RPMs on, on Media mm. Mind. Uh, now, not to say that's all travel sites, but like display ads crushing it in the, in some of those sites. So I think that would work. But I also think there's other things you can do in terms of sponsorships and outreach and things like that that I have zero experience on. But like all things, just in time learning, right? Build the site, figure out, just figure it out as you go. Do some research, yeah. figure it out. Um, I don't need to have all the answers. But if you get the, the nice thing about this business is you get the traffic. That's the hard part. You know what I mean? Yeah. Monetizing, it's actually not that. Uh, now, can you become a master at monetization? Sure. But monetize, getting the traffic, getting the audience is the hard part. And then you can kind of back. That's kind of what I'm doing with Twitter and some of these other things. It's like, you know, I'm interested in sharing this stuff. I like doing it, which is why I'm doing it first and foremost. But I'm also, I share this openly. Like I'm, build, I'm consciously trying to build an audience. And I'm doing that because I know that I can back into that a business. And I would only ever build a business that I believe in and do things that I believe in. But like you can do that with a lot of these things. You can put the work in and then figure out the monetization. I'm not saying that's the best strategy, by the way. Maybe you should spend some time <laughs> up front uh, figuring it out. Uh, but just to say that you can do the the work and then figure it out as you go, more or less. You don't need all the answers up front. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of us started anyway, right? Not knowing too yeah. much, learning from YouTube or from different courses and things like that and just getting stuck in, then realizing maybe your first few articles suck, but then just getting better from there. I said that my first 15, like if I really am judging my articles closely, my first 15 are garbage. Like the keyword research was bad. The content's bad. Um, but it's like all things like I, you know, I might've consumed more content maybe than anyone. <laughs> like I, I listen to more podcasts. I watch more YouTube videos. I read more posts about how to do blogging before starting maybe than anyone. And I still effed it up for the first 15 posts. Yeah. Right. So if that tells you anything to me, it tells do a little bit up front. Right. You don't want to make terrible mistakes that you could avoid because people have done this. But don't get so caught up in learning that you don't do it ever. Right. That's a cycle. I've been caught in that cycle for a lot of different things in my life where you just start consuming, 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 and you never start. You never just jumped in and did it. But like you said, there's a ton of smart people in the space. A lot of them have the same story. My first 10 to 15 posts are terrible. So if that tells you, that tells you, you should start now. Get those out of the way, right? Like get yeah. those done now instead of waiting a year to write 15 bad posts. Mm. Write them today and then you'll your 16th, your 17th, your 18th will start ranking or, or be better. Um, but, you know, don't don't delay so long that you think you have to know everything for sure. Yeah, you got to take action and just learn as you go. Make the mistakes so you don't make them again. For sure. Yep. That's a big part of it. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Mike. I think we covered 
pretty much everything with your site and, and the things you're doing in the future of your site. Is there, I know you mentioned your Twitter, maybe you want to mention your Twitter again where people can reach you? Yeah, I'm, I'm very active uh, on uh, at niche down. This is yet another thing that, you know, you, you, you're you so hyper-focused for so long and then all of a sudden I've got the niche twins, I've got Twitter and it's, my time just getting sucked in all these different areas. <laughs> so I, have to be, I think I have to be careful about that. But I, I am enjoying Twitter a lot. It's already opened up. I've been on it for 45 days and it has already opened up a ton of relationships. Oh, was that quick? Yeah, it was, it's been, (laughs) today's like 40, whatever. But um, the amount of opportunities that I've gotten and the the side conversations that I'm having and people like avenues that I'm exploring now never would have been a possibility without the audience that I've built over the last, Mm. you know, some odd days. So um, I think it's a good use of my time. There's no ROI quote unquote from it you don't need to have, you know, not, not everything has to have an ROI, but if you're going to spend your time doing it, you either have to really love it or there's got to be some value there. But, um, yeah. So anyways, that's where I'm at. I'm very active on there. I share a lot. And then the things that we want to go in deeper on, we'll definitely put on uh, niche twins.com. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on Michael and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks James. This was fun. And, uh, this hopefully I think I have one more of these and then, uh, I'll be done with talking about the same stuff for the next, <laughs> for a little while, but it's been fun. Good experience. Awesome. Cheers. All right. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you're listening until the next episode. Goodbye.